So I think most of you were out at Alley Creek and you saw the operation there to clean out the tanks uh, after a storm uh, where there's no head house. So we wanted to show you today what an operation looks like with a head house. Um, similar, although much larger here than we'll be at Gowanus. Um, so if we just want to start with the, yeah, we'll start with the one that says Gowanus Canal Red Hook CSO Storage Tank. Okay. Everybody's got it. See those? Everybody's got one. Yeah. So this would be the head house uh, above the storage tanks, as you can you can see here. This is just a schematic. It's not a final rendering, but just gives you a look at, at, at what we're thinking. But where, where you see this inclined um, set of lines, those are bar screens. You're going to see those here at the facility. And basically what those are is a, a series of metal bars spaced about an inch apart um, that capture any kind of material that's in wastewater, um, rags, sticks, tin cans, plastic soda bottles um, that, that would otherwise get into the tank uh, and have to be cleaned out later. So at, at Alley Creek, when we were out there and you saw them vacuuming out the tank, all of that debris that gets screened out by this equipment, by these bar screens, would otherwise get into the tank and have to be cleaned out. So this system does screens those materials out automatically, and it goes automatically into a dumpster, which then gets removed. So mm -hmm. you're going to see that as well. By the way, all of that is done in an odor-controlled space. So all of the material that's removed from sewage and is sewage-laden when it gets pulled out, um, you, you, you won't get that smell outside the building. And you know, we'll, we'll see that again in operation. Um, there's other equipment that you can see, these, these circular pipes. Again, I mentioned odor control. This facility has significant odor control. The Gowanus facility, when it's uh, built, the head house will have significant odor control. Again, we're, we're capturing primarily stormwater, uh, but, but there's, there's a sewage component to it. You, you really want to do that in an odor control space. I think when we were out at Alley, everybody got a whiff of, of what it smells like when, when materials removed from the tank. We got run off last night into this facility. It, the, the, the tank's filled with CSO. In fact, we're doing the pump <coughs> back now to Coney Island. I don't think anybody smelled anything. And even when you go inside the building, you really don't smell anything because of the, the odor control system there. So, so you're going to see a lot of similar duct work like this, just moving air, pulling air out, sending it through carbon vessels that scrub the air. We're going to show you that as well. We'll have the same thing at, at Red Hook. Um, there are also pumps to remove the grit that settles to the bottom of the tank. That's done automatically here. Um, it will be done automatically in the Gowanus head house. At Alley Creek, the grit was removed with the vacuum trucks that you saw, and that's done periodically. So really what we're, we're going to show you is um, you know, a similar arrangement to what's going to be in the Gowanus head house. And you know, again, you'll notice how, how, how quiet it is, how odor-free it is, and just how automatic it is. It, we, we really have essentially no footprint on the neighborhood itself and the surrounding area. And that's really the intent of, of why we want to have a head house at Gowanus. I think that one thing you'll see here is that the, um, no, you won't see it, but the, the tanks here are not uh, sequential tanks. The tanks at Gowanus and at some of our other facilities uh, are, go, they don't all fill at once. It goes from one to the other. And the reason for that is that that does a better job of capturing the sediment and letting it settle, um, which is one of the one of the major goals. Um, we think we you get better you get better sediment reduction um, in this kind of tank. Right. So I, I don't know if you you all have this drawing here. This is what Commissioner Lloyd is referring to that, and we have this similar setup at our Flushing Bay CSO retention facility, whereas instead of just having <laughs> one large tank or or in this case here at, at how to get four discrete tanks that individually fill and grit settles out in each of them. Um, this system that we have proposed for Gowanus and the one that we currently have at Flushing, uh, flow when it rains will first go into one tank. If there's enough storm flow for that tank to fill, it will then over, overflow a wall, a weir wall, and fill a second tank. 
there's enough storm flow getting into the, the, the collection system, it'll fill a third and fourth and so on. We like that better because if you do have some minimal storms, maybe only one or two cells will fill. And we think we get much better grit removal because the flow goes into there, has time to, to, to better settle out. Um, it's, it's, I, I just think it, it, it makes it easier to, to then remove grit later on. Operationally, I think it's simpler. Okay. Could you walk us through the, the, the journey of the CSO? Sure. Like it just it comes in through this. Yeah, so you'll see in this in this photo, I'm sorry I don't have a big rendering, but so the flow comes comes into the facility, you can follow the arrows. It'll then go through that, that series of bar screens. Uh, remember in the, in the other photo, those, those inclined uh, towers. And again, it's just a series of metal bars to remove material, large, larger material. Uh, before it goes into the tanks themselves, that gets automatically raked out. And then the flow continues on. It'll fill the first cell. Again, if there's enough of a storm, it'll fill a second cell. If there's enough of a storm, it'll continue on into a third and fourth cells. Um, at, at some point, if we get such a significant storm that the entire, all of the basins become full, then there can be an overflow and a release into the canal. And that's what you see then later on uh, down the line. If all of the base, if there's a significant storm, all of the basins fell. And Kevin, how many times a year, half a dozen times a year, we expect that that's going to happen? Yeah, at, at, at any million gallon tank, it's uh, six times a year, right? That there would, that, that, that the cells would fill and there would be an overflow. That's you all time. overflowed last, from last night? Uh, where? Here? Uh, I don't know. Did no. somebody, we didn't know. We did not. Yeah, can I ask a question that, I don't know if the diagrams would be helpful. Um, and I'm not sure I'm going to ask the question correctly because I'm not sure I really am getting the, the, the technical aspects, but my, my understanding of them at all getting it right is that part of the argument from the EPA folks when they say that they're not sure a headhouse is needed has to do with like the facility that's at the head of the canal. And I thought I'd heard somebody say something about screens existing there or being available there. And so maybe you could explain, I don't know if you could explain what their argument is and why you guys disagree with it or, yeah. or what, but it's like... I don't know if it would be helpful to kind of explain through the diagram what, what it is that everybody's talking Holly about. Holly Creek has, has a head house, mm -hmm. has, well actually has a remote head house, mm -hmm. has a, a pumping station, which is um, what that would, wh which would be similar. Mm -hmm. right. So both at Alley Creek and at Gowanus, there were existing pumping stations. The pumping station at Gowanus was there for, you know, 100 years. Um, Alley Creek has the, the Doug, new, uh, new old Douglaston pumping station, which, which had been there prior to, to the tanks being built. And those pumping stations really served the immediate area around the facility, basically taking sewage from homes and businesses in, the, in those local areas and then pumping it over to a treatment plant from those stations. So, um, you know, it, 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 while you could say, well, there, there are screens there. They're really not built for these storage tanks. They weren't built for the storage tanks in Alley. They're not being built for this storage system um, at Kiwanis. I mean, Kevin, you could. Yeah, and, and, and so I, I believe what you're referring to is EPA had recently suggested that maybe we could relocate some of the functions that we're talking about needing to be included in the head house just right on our existing pumping stations. Right, and that's right. Yeah. We don't think that that's possible. Um, there's only um, a limited area between um, the new existing wastewater pumping station and our property line to the east. Um, there are very large influence sewers that come in to, uh, to the property and, and flow is directed to the wastewater uh, pumping station during dry weather. And then there's an overflow structure for uh, CSO events. And we actually installed a screen there uh, so that during CSO events, we're, we're actually screening the flow and removing any solid debris from the flow that would be discharged to the canal. Mm -hmm. um, there would be a significant reconstruction of that area required to divert flow to this proposed tank, but we don't think that there's enough room there to install some screens. And even if you, if you did have the ability to install the screens, you would still need an above ground structure there to enclose it to provide conveyors and dumpsters and odor control and everything else. We'd still need to do that. We, we certainly don't think that there's enough room there to do that. So to the degree that EPA's concern is that if we have to acquire property, which I think is their major concern about harm, mm -hmm. are one of the great advantages to the park for them. Right. Um, 
is we would still have to acquire property if we have if we have a remote head house. If we have no head house, then we have Alley Creek with the having to close the park to clean it out periodically and all the odor and noise that goes with that. Mm -hmm. I had a, kind of a two-part question, um, and first of all, thank you for these renderings. This really helps. Uh, the first part is, can you give an approximation of square footage for this whole thing, uh, just like the, the footprint overall? The, the, the head house or the whole tank system? The, the whole tank everything? system yeah. and the head house, yeah. So for um, an 8 million gallon tank, and, and, you know, and, mm -hmm. as you know, we're still trying to sort mm -hmm. out the Right. what the final size of right. the tank is going to be with EPA. Right. But right now the 8 million gallon tank is roughly 60,000 square foot right. uh, uh, footprint. Right. Um, and, you know, we can play with that a little bit. You know, for example, if you go deeper, you can, sh right. you know, shrink the footprint a little bit. But there are some trade-offs, you know. You can also go shallower and have a, have a, a, a larger footprint. So, right. you know, that, that's something that needs to be optimized once, you know, we agree on the final tank sizing. But for this facility... The head house itself. The head house uh, is is roughly twenty five thousand square foot. Okay. And right now we've we've been going through, you know, we're calling it uh, uh, like a value engineering exercise to mm -hmm. just take another look at the facility, um, uh, make sure that, you know, all of our assumptions regarding um, the size of equipment, um, the area required around each piece of equipment for maintenance purposes and removal purposes. And uh, you know to get the truck in and out and dumpsters and everything else that all of those assumptions you know will hold up you know mm -hmm. with the goal of trying to reduce the size sure. of, of the building you know a lot of the work that we've done today was really to support um, you know the siting and cost estimating right. effort mm -hmm. um, you know we haven't done a detailed design although you know we have been able to produce renderings for helps you right the the second part is uh, the commissioner mentioned um, that a head house is, you know, in some way proportionate to the size of the tank. Is is there a, an equation behind that, or is, are there a lot of variables involved? I mean, I think that's yeah. one of the things that people are going to say is sort of like, hey, we're at a tank that's, you right. know, it's 50 million gallon tank, of course, and as the commissioner mentioned, obviously the head house won't be this big, but sure. what is the proportionate, and how does that scale? So this facility, even though it's a 50 million gallon uh, storage facility, 30 million gallons of that is considered to be inline storage. Okay. Um, and the reason that they're able to do that here is because this is a very flat section of Brooklyn. It's Flatlands Avenue is right here. <coughs> if the sewers are flat, you can store a lot of flow within the sewers. In we don't have inline storage. Just define the term. The basically, end. using the sewers. Right. Not down. not in the not in tanks. Not no. in the tanks. So there's right. 20 million gallons worth of tanks. Here. Right. Got it. Um, oh, I got it. And then and the sewer system provides another. Yeah, there was another. Th this one right here, I think, is helpful. So this is so a, this, this is a twenty. This is a twenty million gallon tank. The tank itself is twenty, but you know there are influent sewers and other. You know, so you got twenty million gallons uh, in in storage upstream. You have ten million gallons in these influent um, sewers, and then you've got what we call you know twenty million gallons in. in of offline storage. But is so, the head house dealing with the non inline storage or is it dealing with the total capacity of that 50 million gallon? It does provide some odor control for some of the inline storage as well, right? We but not control. the same amount? Yeah, it, it, the, the entire 50 million gallons get screened and odor controlled. Right. It all has to go through the head house to get right. to the tanks to be pumped from the tanks to Coney Island. So all of it goes through that process. So while it's stored in the sewer system, eventually, for it to get to the treatment plant, it's got to come through this facility. Is that kind of calculation though included with, the, for, for example, we're considering the Gowanus Head House. Right now it's associated with this storage tank. Does that also, what is the consideration for the sewers that are attached to that? I mean, is that, it sounds like that part of what you're saying is the inline, the head house also takes care of some of the inline stuff. Mm -hmm. Is some of the inline stuff in consideration, infrastructure in consideration for the head house here? Well, we're actually, my, my point when I was talking about it is we're not getting a lot of inline storage. There isn't any, right? I got it. Right, because got it. It's, 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 it, there's a very, yeah, exactly, okay. because of the slope. Mm -hmm. But what is this? But the head what house, is the head house is, That's just this head problem. house is laid out to handle the eight million in terms of the number of screens and the amount of odor control, okay. right. Got it, so it's a very fixed amount versus this has got, this is, a, it's basically a different system altogether. Just much smaller. 
Right, right. But as Dan just pointed out, there is some storage before the head house. I mean, this it's is not really under storage. The, this the, is a pump stage. Minimum. Minimum. That's just, a pump stage. That's just a diversion, right? That's just a diversion uh, uh, structure to divert flow into the into the facility. It's just simplified on that drawing. That's all. Can I ask how so the terms influent and effluent are being used on the on these diagrams on the diagram of this facility? Influent and effluent with respect to to what exactly? Um. You talking about on the, which diagram? The one at? you just had. This uh, one here. Yeah. Influent channels. I mean, what what distinguishes that as an influent? At what point does it become effluent? What's what's the difference? I'm guessing that there's something that it goes into that sure. makes it influent. And once it goes out of there, that's effluent. So flow comes from the collection area up here, which mm -hmm. isn't really shown. Okay, enters and then starts making its way towards. The, the CSO facility. This is the CSO facility. This is the underground portion, this gray part here, okay? Um, this building, um, which we're gonna be going into next, we're in this building right here, actually, collections facility. Right. I'm sorry. I can actually <laughs> see the <Okay>. right. <laughs> um, Enters this building here. It is screened and then enters the tank. And for CSO events that would exceed the capacity of the tank, flow would proceed, would flow directly into Padigan Basin. Okay which is similar to what we Vinny had right. walked so right. through before. Yeah. Here, where you have influent and then effluent. So it's really all with respect to the, the tank, essentially, and all the, the screens and anything else associated with the tank. Right. Pre that, it's influent. Afterwards, in a, in a CSO event, it's effluent. Yes. Okay. And what do we call what gets pumped out to go to the plant? Uh, <laughs> Tank dewatering flow. I mean, we're, we're, <laughs> tank pump back. Yeah, it's, okay. we'll pump back. Yeah. Okay. And so, what is the square footage of the head house here, on, uh, 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 footprint wise? You no, know, we were just talking about yeah. that. We don't think we can get that for yeah. you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. None of us knows it off the top of our head. Right. I mean, I guess the other it bigger than it needs to be because you got a lot of space here. <laughs> right. Well, we're in we're in the crew quarters. This yeah. is an entire. This is a. This is for all of South Brooklyn. This is not related to the tank. Right. Where we're sitting but now. But having visited the tank, it seems like it's got it's a lot bigger than than it. I mean, you don't have to make it so small here because you got a lot of space over here. Well, that's it's true. That's true. And there also was a initially going to be some other equipment there that is not located there, which made a big storage right. room. And, and Kevin, please correct me if I'm wrong, but you're also designing to a time frame here, too. You, you want to get the water in the tanks as fast as possible to prevent the, from overflowing upstream. So you build, you know, again, we're talking about 50 million gallons here. You need to, you need to size that properly to capture the most while overflowing the least. Mm. So the hydraulic capacity here? something on the order it's nearly three billion gallons per day that's how much flow could be screened and enter the tanks and flow through the tanks if need be at Kiwanis um, we're talking about 300 million gallons so about a tenth of the flow through the tank so on the on the square footage maybe a follow-up question so all, some, so all of the CSO doesn't come in within 24 hours it continues to flow in well, yeah, it's, so you might have a storm that could produce a flow of 3 billion gallons per day, but it might only last an hour or two. Mm -hmm. So it, it has to do with how much flow can be delivered to the tank. It, you know, it, it happens almost instantaneously. But a Gowanus, how would it work? How would, how would it get, how would it come in to fill eight, an 8 million gallon tank? It would, it'd be, it, it's, a, it's a similar thing. Uh, the, uh, in an average year, the larger storm would produce something on the order of 300 million gallons per day. So the influent channels and the screens to the tank have to be sized to that 300 million gallons per day. So does that mean it would keep going for 10 days? I mean, how does, how does 300, oh, 300 yeah, million gallons. Correct, right. so, so, so that amount, that at that rate, not amount, but when we say MGD, that's a rate, can get through the tanks and overflow okay, at that rate. All right, so if we're getting Let's move away from square footage. Let's talk about what people will see. What's the length, width, height? Um, so the building dimensions, uh, I, I just I have it on my phone. I can pull that out. It, it's roughly uh, I don't want to say the wrong number. <laughs> so let me just look it up. It, does, uh, it looks like the scale of the building that's on the site now. Essentially. 
Uh, well, yeah, the, 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 the thing that looks like the site is smaller. Building. Yeah. 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 It's, yeah. A, it's really just a wall. Right. And then open space inside. Right. I'll, I'll get you the dimensions. Yeah. yeah, and how much above ground? I mean, you're talking about one floor, so you two figure floors. a floor from no, 10 feet? It, it's two it's, floors. It's two floors. and, and No, these are one floor is below, right? No, but look at the seat. There's a oh, floor. I see, yes. It has yeah. to be, you'll yeah. see when we go. So you're talking about 25 feet? Yes. Yeah. It, it'll be, it'll be taller three, than that. Three, three, three floors, yeah. Yeah. Because you've got another floor up here. Ah. There are there are some screens that, that are being used that might reduce it a few feet in height, but wouldn't make a huge difference. Okay. Right. And, and the follow-up question I was going to, like, while you're looking up these numbers, and it sounds like this isn't, Calculated yet, but like, what is the sort of minimum footprint that you can envision? I mean, I mean like when you said 25,000 square feet, I assume that there's limits to how much of that can be vertical, right? And so, well, 25,000 is the footprint. The footprint. Oh, that's the footprint. That's and then right. there's, I see. I yeah. understand. Okay, got it. Got it. And, and as I mentioned, we're, we're going through this evaluation to try and shrink that down. Got it. Mm -hmm. And Perfect. I know that one of the questions will be, and I, I like actually, I know that there's probably not a clear answer in this, understandably. Um, is just again about this question of proportionate. Um, so if this is a 50 million ga ga uh, gallon tank here, um, it's roughly 10 times the size of the tank that we're going to get in Gowanus. That doesn't necessarily mean that the head house is going to be 10 times less than this because there are core infrastructure things and you need a hangar, you need all these so things. It's not one to one. So it's not one to one. So is there any kind of we can provide you with that. Because I, I know that is going to be a question that people will ask. Um, is sort of like, hey, if you're, you visited this site, but what's the proportionality? Like, how do you scale it? Um, and I know those aren't easy questions, but I, I think sure. it would be helpful to. We, we can provide that comparison. That would be great. You and have you, I'm sorry, go ahead. Have you looked at schematics for what the head house would be like on the park site? Yeah. Um, I don't know. We have. We have You've seen the. I don't think I brought any today. Uh, but we have provided renderings in the past. I don't think I have any. Very that. schematic. Yeah, it's, very it's not a design. Yeah. Just a so you haven't done, I mean, blocking. in terms of how the conduit would run. It would be. It, the, it would just essentially. Yeah, yeah we, do, we do have that, and we showed it in the presentation. Okay. We can, okay. we can, but it's not to this level. Yeah. Right, no, it's very, very, very schematic. Okay. Now, how does this configuration here compare with the North River treatment plan? Is it about the same kind of a uh, setup? Well, that's a wastewater treatment plan. I understand. Very different facilities. So it's not set up in uh, the same way at all? Well, that's, that's, we're treating sewage over there at North River. Over here, we're not, we're just storing and not, okay. not really and screening. And screening. Yeah. That's something like a return activated sludge. That's exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And that's also an unusual facility because the footprint was so, the space available was so mm -hmm. small that it's, the tanks are extremely deep, which is very difficult. Yeah, and it was built on levels, actually. Uh, the only reason I'm asking is because the neighborhood is complaining a lot about the odors that come out of that one. Oh, yeah, yeah. So when we first built, this is the North River facility um, on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. When we first built that facility, as the commissioner mentioned, because we had a very small footprint, we had to go deep with the tanks. They were odorous when we first started up the plant in, in the late 80s, early 90s. And since then, we've put in over $200 million worth of odor control to that facility. It's much better now. Well, but I think you'll see when you go, there was a storm yesterday, and we and the this facility was in use, and the, um, the container has screenings in it, so you can see, you'll be able to see what it's like. It's actually active. Well, I mean, speaking of location of uh, sewage treatment plants, so... Red Hook Wire Pollution Control Plant, of course, is in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Uh, I don't know if that's three miles away or two miles away. Uh, and then the other, and that, so this outfall, you know, we want to get it to the Navy Yard Red Hook plant, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. So that's pretty far away. Um, so I'm not suggesting we have a sewage treatment plant here. <laughs> but, <laughs> but then if this were to cross Nevin Street, that's not that far from this site. So in weighing the two different site options, particularly given that some of the property owners adjacent to uh, the canal, you know, have this proposal, you know, to give over park space and allow easement for the connections. I'm just curious, you know, how, how, how much more difficult it is 
on the other side of Nevin Street, given uh, the grade and where the where the CSO is is coming from. I mean, and your concern is about where the overflow goes to, or? Well, I'm just, I, you know, obviously the big question that people have in weighing the two options is, you know, the trade-offs. Uh, and given the new development of um, some of the property owners there offering a third solution uh, to enable replacement of park space and uh, enabling, <coughs> and also the fact that there's a big, a lot for sale on the south side of DeGraw that could be a staging area. Um, on the other side of Nevins. I'm just trying to, you know, figure out what the considerations are on those two options, if there's any further thinking. Right. So I think that the, um, the site south of DeGraw is extremely unattractive from a functioning point of view for us, and I don't think we can have a full discussion today, but we, because we don't have drawings and everything, but we mm -hmm. could lay that out for you. Um, and I think that... And, and I mean for purposes of staging as opposed to where the tank is. Like if the tank were where the pool site is, for instance. Right. For argument's sake, this, this, the south side of DeGraw could be a staging area <clears throat> as opposed to... I, I mean, I've heard that putting the tank here, the staging area would be on this side of Nevins, mm -hmm. between the canal and Nevins, south of DeGraw, which is where the film studio is. Right, that's, that's, the, that's the thought now. Right, what I'm saying is that on the other side of Nevins, there's another site across the street from that, which is on the south side of the park. Right, yes, no, I know, yeah. So I'm just saying, like this, this the station well, I think, area for I think this. we think, th I, th I think that we think that the site that's available is not large enough to be a staging area for this work. So we would still have to do acquisition. And acquisition is acquisition in terms of the process and the timing. So we don't think there's a net gain in terms of schedule if we do that. But just to be clear, I'm like you'd have to acquire the, the film studio site, right? But the mirror image of it on the other side of Nevin Street is the size of the city block not all, not, not the whole depth of Yeah, but lot. not all of it's for sale. Okay. Right, only like it's multiple owners. It's, mm -hmm. many, it's many parcels. Yeah, okay. And I think there are two parcels that are for sale. Mm -hmm. So it's, it doesn't okay. solve the problem as a staging area. We still would have to acquire it. Right. But DeGraw, but DeGraw being a dead end street, <coughs> right, you could close part of DeGraw off so you'd have that plus DeGraw. Saying, for argument's sake. For argument's sake. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I, just, I, think in terms I just want to understand if you guys are looking at it. And of access and circulation, I think we think, I think we think the site's not big enough. Yeah. And that it's, Butler and then the end. So we would still have to go through acquisition. Further acquisition. Right. right. Okay. You want and to also say? the Parks Commissioner still feels very strongly that that substitute space, which eventually would be between two tall buildings, is not, and it's not directly continuous from the park. It's a jog over. I think he was adamant that that was not, he didn't think an attractive solution as so, park space. Got it. So there are no other options in consideration right now by DEP aside from the one that is proposed here? Well, but, but for, for argument's sake, if, if, I mean, the two complexes on either side, on the Butler end and the DeGraw end, were four-story buildings. I mean, that's not huge buildings. And if no, it's but 60, that, square no one can possibly park, believe that anyone would acquire that land and use that for that purpose long term. There's no way it could pay for itself. Okay, so the feasibility. Yeah. Economic feasibility. Yeah. What's the thing with it? $75 million for 99 years? Yes. It's going to be supported by a four-story art center. Yeah. And just to... I forgot to talk about the renewal lease of my apartment. <laughs> 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 to repeat something that I've already heard, but just to get it directly from you guys, from site acquisition to completion, how many? How long? Oh, who has the... 
So, uh, oh, once we've acquired the site. Once we've acquired. Oh, okay. The site. I mean, we're talking about you know an eight to ten year project. I mean, this is something that is being negotiated with EPA. Uh, no, no, no. Right? From site finished. Once you, we you, have the site. Once you have the site to completion of the facility, approximately how long? It, it's on the order of eight years or so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because of, because the site the site's so constrained. Right. And, and soil remediation. Right. There needs yeah. right. Both sites, regardless of which site it is, whether it's the, the park site or it's uh, the head end site, they both need uh, significant remediation. So is it, that impacts the dredging schedule significantly, right? Well, I mean, not necessarily. So, you know, this is a schedule that we've put forward. Right, okay, right, right, you know, right. it, it, the way I see it, it's a starting point with, with EPA as far as negotiations. Mm -hmm. We certainly have to coordinate with. National Grid, um, and you know, National Grid is working on negotiating a schedule with EPA as well. Right, right. So you know, I know that I've heard dates as early as EPA wants all the dredging and capping completed by 2021 uh, in the canal, which you know, we're, we're, you know, I think we would have a hard time. I mean, I think we we would have a hard time constructing the tank by that time. But there are things that 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 can be done. You know that. I mean, I, it, I, don't, I don't know how much we want to talk about that, you know, right now, but, you know, this is all subject to negotiations with EPA right now. Let's just say Absolutely. that. Let's put yeah. it that way. Right, but it, I guess, because EPA, one of their positions has been like, we're not going to start dredging until the tanks are built, right? No, 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 they're dredging, they're st what they have to do is, Kevin, you do it. They have to build the So, so you talk about in the canal? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So they have to do ISS. Mm -hmm. So ISS is in situ soil stabilization. Right. That's going to be done below the bed, I got the canal bed. Mm -hmm. um, then they're going to dredge um, some portions of the canal. Mm -hmm. And then they, they, they put down, um, it's just called hardening, a uh, hardening layer or a, a main, um, uh, it's, 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 it's hardening, but it's basically um, yeah. rocks right. and, and then right. um, some clay and some clean sand. Actually, the clay might be the might But where in the sequence does the, yeah. does the I, containment wall come? I may have just been confused. I was just After trying to figure out the sequencing. Or before? Yeah. Oh, oh, the containment wall will be first. So Absolutely. Just, so that's the only... I guess I'm just trying to figure... The, the, the dependencies yeah. of this to the schedule for dredging... That they're not really they're related not, other than... Right, that you know, what we've heard is EPA would like the tanks to be operational prior to the cap being placed in the canal. Oh, prior to the capping, okay. Right. Got it. That helps. So Can this we, so, so this Guana site here, this is what is this what is this portion? That's just the below ground portion of the tank. Okay. So you know what so we So this say, is head house and this is Exactly. And and the below ground is all this under here. Exactly. And so what we've said is, you know, that you know, there might be some portions of that that could be made open space following construction of the tank. And so then Kevin the Jeffrey's concern here is that if you, because already the, the park is rather segmented by hand, hard, big, big walls, hard ball, handball courts, and um, changing houses mm -hmm. that pretty much cut the park up into these. Right, but I think they're spaces. assuming that the park will be sig significantly reworked. Right, in fact, with right. you know, the western third will have to be dug up. Right. If, after the remediation of the park, there is a great opportunity for the Parks Department in conjunction with the community to completely reimagine the layout of, of the park. Um, but what the, and it's not just Borough Commissioner Jeffrey, but it's, it's Parks Commissioner Silver, what they have expressed concern, um, certainly in meetings before the CAG and other community groups, is that breaking up one park with a city street in the middle of it uh, causes problems for programming and sort of contiguous use, and that is what they um, are very concerned with. And so while currently within the footprint of Thomas Green, yes, there is, there's a playground, there's a basketball court, there's a swimming pool, there are changing rooms and bathrooms within, it is still one park in a discrete location where you do not have to intercede with oncoming traffic right, to get to right. it. I mean, it's, you know, it's, the, it's why Olmstead thought Prospect Park was a better park than Central Park, and said we'll never have changed the location to get rid of Flatbush going down the middle of it. Right. I mean, once you, uh, a self-contained park with no traffic intrusion um, is 
a gem that's almost irreplaceable, mm -hmm. and that's why Commissioner Silver feels so strongly about it. But it also has distinct rooms, if you will, from like the meadow to the nether mead and passages between. Right. <laughs> Did we but anyway, we'll Prospect Park at great length. Yeah, we both worked there. But um <laughs> but this park that you would provide you'd have to cross streets to get to anyway. Right? But it would be an addition. It would be an addition. But if I mean, just for argument's sake, it would be that that's it would the trade-off. It would be view plane and green space. Right. right. Directly. I mean, that's the trade-off because, you know, I mean, you know, I've seen an example, uh, you know, it's quite in I don't know how to say that, in Philadelphia, you know, where they've integrated a head house and park, you know, where it's... I don't know where, I haven't seen that. Okay. Well, I can email you guys, you know, the example, right. but it's pretty seamless right. Right. and... You know, you can, you right, can, why you can you move do that? through. I, why would you do that when you can keep the park intact? Well, What's because the, the trade, obviously the trade. the tanks the, and the head house in the park. Well, because the trade-off is if, if there's significant delay and extra cost in acquiring new property by eminent domain and displacing businesses and, and you have public land. I mean, that's the argument, Yeah, right? but the disruption of the park is in perpetuity. But if, but if, like North River Sewage Treatment Plant, you have a whole park on top of the sewage treatment plant, you know, there could be so, some solutions for No, because that's to see the plant. That's why the tanks at the plant are so deep. You can't do that because you have a park, you have a, a given ground level, whereas the whole park was constructed on top of, on top of the plant. Right. You have, you're going to have that 25, 30 foot high building. And by the time you make it accessible, you're going to use up two thirds of the park ramping up to it. If you want to use the top of the head house, or you're going to just have a huge hole in the park where the head house is. Right, but I mean, if, if it's in a corner of the park where you can you can't maneuver put it in around corner, it. It's too big. You well, can I put mean, it in the corner oh, so and have a corridor actually, down the what side. What I was interested in seeing is like some renderings, just like you've done here, mm -hmm. of what the what a, the minimum amount of space for right. a head and house so and how we that think could it's 25,000 square feet, and it may be slightly less, but it's not going to be hugely less. Right. And I could be able to cut it in half. Yeah. <laughs> or, or make it more oblong, right. you know, on one end versus the other, so you could still pass through. Like it could be, you know, in it's not square and in take order up, to achieve what? In order to achieve your contiguity. I know, but in order to achieve, why would we torture the park like this and, and our facility? Well, be, because people have raised, I mean, you raised the, the viability of, 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 you know, this offer of, giving over this land. Other P EPA is obviously raising the viability or the ability to, in a timely way, acquire this much property through right. eminent domain. Right, right. But I'm I just saying that's a trade-off, so really we have to look I at think, the trade-off. You know, I think we've, through our law department, laid out for them, you know, a very compelling case for what all the experiences in terms of acquisitions. So, you know. I mean, I, I, mean, I guess, I, I guess, this torture has to happen somewhere, right? So there's also but it doesn't businesses. have to happen in a park. <laughs> well, but it also doesn't have to happen to displace businesses and jobs, you know, where we have an area. They're going to be displaced anyway. Not, not necessarily. But I mean, if it's a question of degree. They would go someplace else. I mean, the whole place is the whole area is going to be rezoned and is going to be redeveloped to vacant land. So if we're here, that's a big assumption. If, if we're here, the jobs will be there. If we're here, we the jobs will the whole, be there. We don't know how the whole area is going to be rezoned. Oh, we I think it, big, it's, it's almost unthinkable that it won't be. If maybe just a quick, I can just say like, uh, no, I don't mean that this is an answer to this question. I, I can tell you guys one of the questions that we've been trying to figure out. I mean, I think that the the plan that is laid out here is certainly has been, like the folks who've been talking about the park, has been the preference to, to have you know, the head house totally separate to maintain the footprint of the playground, everything that you guys have been talking about. I, I think there is a question that has come up of, are the dynamics potentially gonna change if developers are suddenly suggesting that they could get involved and potentially offer some new park space? What is the appeal of the EPA of that going to be? And I think the question that we have had is like, what is this, if the EPA, Cites the tank under the pool and disorders the way to do that, then what are the solutions involving all of the space that's available, potentially including some new space, that would like nonetheless mitigate the impact on the park and, and, and 
ensure that the community benefits are maximized as much as possible, including, yeah, I mean, including the vision that you were laying out, yeah. Commissioner, of, of really having kind of green space that goes from the, the playground all the way to the canal. I mean, I think one of our thoughts is that, you know, that the, the involvement of local developers and property owners is much different if it's actually something where all of the owners of that entire parcel are involved and that can be treated as a piece of land that can be worked with versus only using half of it, which is much less appealing. Um, so again, I don't think that there's an answer to that, but I think that that's certainly the question that we've been asking ourselves is- right. But why we, are the yeah. developers preferable to the city owning that land? I'm not saying that they are from our perspective, but well, from the community no, perspective, no there's just stuff that's off, out of our control. And yeah. We're, yeah. yeah, I don't think it's a preference. I think it's more what, you know, whether right or wrong, the EPA has raised that flag that condemnation could be a process and the community's tr trying to get information and respond to that. And if another option is presented, the community is looking at it. I right. think that's so pretty let us, much So it. let us share with you, and we don't have it with us today, yeah. but let us share with you the what we think, the details of what the acquisition or condemnation yeah. process are. And lay that out as a, you know, so you'll, right. you'll have more information about that. And I the city has a lot of experience with right. acquisition. Yeah. and and. For Dan's question, I, I think that one of the things is now that you know word has gotten out that there is this you know this developer that's in play and and, and, and might be interested in getting engaged in this process. Um, if the developer is asserting that it's a viable option economically, um, and but but the, the city four story art center. In, well, in, in, the, in the in the city <coughs> of not an art center, center. Yeah. <laughs> a four story office building to support well he they're t they're talking seventy five million dollars well now here's the thing so you made a big a big assumption that the whole area is going to get rezoned and all these businesses are going to have to move anyway and we just went through a long process called bridging Gowanus with mm -hmm. Councilman Brad Lander looking at how can we have viable mixed use area right so I think it's a big assumption to say well all these businesses are going to get displaced anyway. I think that's a big assumption. And we should look at it more from the perspective of what are some options for, for how the area could be redeveloped that isn't necessarily condos. And so they, they proposed something and put an offer on the table to donate, you know, like 60,000 square feet of land to the city to op, 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 offer an option. Well, first, all, just curious. first of all, they're only the the development company in the mix right now can only technically speak for twenty five thousand square feet. They're make they are making an assumption on the other twenty five thousand square feet, which by the way only replaces with that what the headhouse would sort of replaces the land that would be taken up more or less um, if the headhouse is put in in the mix. Um, there's also a map street. There's the also a map street underneath that we'd have title to anyway. And mm -hmm. but what it does, but what we've been talking about in terms of the head end site is not only sort of operational ease and efficiency of having the tanks and the head house right next to the current infrastructure, but we're also talking about preserving a community's park in its current footprint, completely redeveloped, redesigned, while adding the opportunity for additional open space for a community that I don't think there's anybody in this room would argue with the fact is currently starved for parkland space. And so I think we've approached it from both perspectives of both operational efficiency, biggest cleanup possible, and preserving open space and even trying to find a way to add to open space. Right. Um, I do think based in the interest of time, I think right. it would be important for us to, to actually go look at the facility yeah. at this point. Great. And let me just add just a small thing here. I'd like to see this conversation in front of the entire keg with Brad there and various other elected. Get everybody's point of view. All in one room. Well, certainly we, you know, we're always happy to participate in any conversation. No, um, I and understand. I just said entire tag today. I just but we'd be happy to. Okay, so we're going to leave this building, walk across the parking lot and into the head house. Um, Chris Ladondo, raise your hand, Chris. We're going to follow him.
I should have brought a poster. Yeah. You look good, man. You don't gotta. You don't have anything. Okay, so we're just gonna walk through the floor. I understand the concerns about the in their domain, but explain to me if you really value the context. Earlier today, you heard that this facility had four discrete tanks. You're actually standing on top of one of the tanks. And all of these openings you see going all the way to the CSO building is, is, a, is direct access to the, to the four tanks. Okay, so you get some sort of scale. They go all the way to the water. They go as far as this building, all the way to that building. Split up into four discrete tanks. All right, so we'll continue to walk towards the building. But does every tank need to have these? What they're there for is if I needed to lower a piece of equipment down there, a backhoe or something for, for cleaning, for repair, that's what these access ports are for. But is there one for every tank? There's two for every tank. Could they be planted in between? Does it need to be a parking they're, they're, they're situated not by what's on grade, they're situated by what's below. Right. But this is a, this wall goes straight down and I can have a planting bed right here. Just thinking about how they Yes, you could. If this wasn't a parking lot and a staging area, yes, you, you could. But understand that if you're going to pull a vehicle or a piece of equipment and lower it down the hole, mm -hmm. that, that planting area becomes a problem. But Chris, that's, that's not true. That wouldn't be okay. frequent, right? No, it's, it's oh, an as infrequent. Opposed to, as opposed to Alley Creek, where you have to do it for everything. Okay, so we're going to walk through the tanks. 20 million gallons. boilers here behind me provide heat to this building, the crew quarters building, and community board 18, which is on the far end of the property. So at Gowanus, there will be a boiler system. It clearly won't be this big, but we need to provide heat for the structure so that the materials don't freeze in the winter. How much is not this big? How much is that? It's not this big. Again, we haven't got to that level of detail yet. It probably is just one of these as opposed to three of these. Or, not or, as nice or, or two small ones. Yeah. You like two for the redundancy aspect of it? Yeah. Okay. So we we'll move down.
Okay, so the original design had additional equipment in this space. During the design and during construction, it was decided not to put that equipment in. I then benefited from this huge storeroom. I can keep all the spare parts here. I can keep the library with all the manuals here. Right. So, obviously, in the Gowanus Head House, we won't need as much storage space. This will be squeezed. The one thing I want to point out in this room, though, is you'll see all of this duct work. The head house, one of the, the, the main features of a, of a head house is that it's an odor controlled space. So air is continually being pulled out of these, these rooms and down below in the tanks, passed through duct work, through carbon filters, which we're going to see soon, and, and scrubbed before it's released outside. So that's one very important feature of a head house. Big things we wanted to sort of show everybody, and I think everybody that's here was also with us at Alley Creek, where we were watching a cleaning happen. It, this is a very, very different experience than what you observed there, both from a sight, sound, and smell perspective. Okay, so let me give you the worst case scenario. All the power goes for whatever reason, right? What just happened? What happens here? I have a where it's a generator on top. Yes, it's black stock generator. Kevin, in terms of screen size, is it? Will the screens be about this size in Gowanus, or? Yeah. It's definitely smaller. But I'll, I'll get you the. I'll get yeah. you the. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, these are bigger. The width. Right. Yeah. To put some scale on that, this is the largest in BWT's inventory. Larger than the 14 treatment plants, because we were looking for that flow through, we needed to build them this big. Right. Leading to the tanks are underneath. Yeah. Yeah. This, this picture is better, yeah. So, this is the facility we're at right now. We're in, we're in this pink building right here on the northern end. So, the screens are literally right here. Got it. So, this is really catching the big, the big stuff. Yes. Yeah, we can walk around. We can walk around. It is handled separately here, yes. So we can walk up the ramp and around. You can get a better idea on the other side. Yeah. To fill the container equally, it moves along these rails. You have to remember this is an unmanned facility. Then you take the whole and then a truck dumpster. Yeah, we can walk around. If you walk to the other side. Cool. 
you can probably see some of the material coming up on the rake right there. So right, these screens are running right now because we're actually pumping the tanks out back to Coney Island. So all that excess beyond the 20 million gallons in the tank is now flowing through here, getting screened. That inline storage we talked about earlier is being screened. It will then be pumped through the interceptor to Coney Island. You could walk down a little further and you can see the, these brake mechanisms bringing the material up. And then on the far end is the container. You can actually see the material that we're removing. Yes, they're, they're actually very heavily maintained okay. because they're the key piece of equipment in this facility. If, if I lose more than two of these screens, I have to shut the gates. I can't process anything here. So they're maintained on a monthly basis. I have a, I actually have a separate staff just to work on these screens. They bring them up. They bring them up. We lower down this grating so that they can work in safety and they can do all sorts of adjustments and, mon and, and preventive maintenance. It, it, it's a process, yeah. yeah. It, these, these are very important pieces of equipment. And you can see in the container what we're removing. I think since 9-11 there was a change in giving public oh, yeah. tours of, of city-owned facilities. Um, so, I, you know, unless it's a situation like this, uh, I do not give public tours. And again, some idea is this container was empty tomorrow morning. So everything you see in the container was from yesterday's storm. So let's, we'll go back around, we'll go down the ramp. But again, if not for these screens, if you don't have a head house, then you gotta actually go into the tank. Back down the ramp. Down, back to the top. actually is the important part of the I think we lost half of the group. Yeah, right. So the only other parts are inside this, and, and, and we'll see, there are, are grit, grit pumps. So once material comes in, you know, we're not capturing sand, small stones, anything. That, that passes through these bars. That will settle in the tanks, and then we have a system to remove that grit. So, so the square footage of this this is where we're in most here. Of, most of it is right. Most, most of, of the this, head house is the screen. So we could paste this off for like what the square Thank footage you. of this is, right? <laughs>
This is a new facility, yeah. Well, relatively new at this point. That was the question. We don't know. We don't know. Okay. about scale, it's really about what the screen why the screens are so important and about odor and sound and right. noise. Right. right? And this is the the odor control. So what you're looking at on the left here are the five carbon scrubbers that clean the air before it gets discharged out the roof. It's filled with activated carbon, so there's no chemicals, there's nothing like that. Um, and I'm able to run three of them and maintain the air in here. So as you can see, as you've walked around, you don't smell anything.
because of the, how much waste came out of it. Yeah, I guess, um, if they had Room right now, and along the lines of design and construction, this was decided to be an unmanned automated facility. So, if it was manned, this would be where the operators would stay and they'd operate the equipment. But it now is at the level where we can do pump back with one click of a mouse from the Pony Island plant, and then all this equipment comes to life, the pump starts, it does everything on its own. has changed so much in the last decade where at one point you needed to have people in place monitoring and controlling things on site. You do that all remotely. Right. We talk about the, the Avenue V pumping station, if you guys know, uh, in Gravesend, it could be run on a smartphone right. where in the past you had to have four men there 24 hours a day. Right. So this, this then became redundancy because in the, in the crew quarters building has a very similar setup to this and it can be operated from there as well. What I, I want to ask about, as um, Chris says, had raised, if the that the idea that it could it could flush itself out completely, and you know, Kevin was suggesting that well, it's not that easy because the screens have to be active, um, and then the whole question of like how high enough and if, if it really flushes out is like well, a tub <clears throat> doesn't necessarily always flush out, but it's the incline of the bottom. If you have like the bottom on a would that help to flush it out in terms of the grit and stuff and stuff? So this facility has 48 flushing gates, 12 per tank, okay? Uh, they open in series and it uses wave action to clean the bottom of the tank. It flushes into a central channel, that channel then goes into the wet well and gets pumped out. So it does a very efficient job of, of moving the grit into, yeah, there you go, Kevin's got a photo. It does. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no. I, I uh, uh, it does a very efficient job as to getting it to the wet well. Do we need to do extra cleaning? We certainly do. Uh, we have it on a, on a time basis. Every three months or so, I, I have to vector out the wet well. I have to vector out the tanks. But but it, it, it's only it's only for preventative measures. It, it's it's not like something that needs to be done to keep the facility in operation. When we talk about a tank that is self-flushing. There's mechanical equipment Behind that does it. that flushing. Absolutely. And so after the tank is dewatered, um, and there are some channels, and you know the the the, uh, uh, the bottom of the tanks are sloped to push materials towards the dewatering pumping station. There's no doubt about it. But then they activate these flushing uh, reservoirs or gates, and the big wave of water comes out and hits the bottom of the tank to help push that material, continue to push that material towards the pumping system. We saw, uh, when we went to Alley Creek, these guys had to go in the tank with the, the vacuums to get into every little nook and cranny. Over here, this pushes it all to one end where it gets pumped out automatically. Right. You can keep that. Right. With the, and that, the gritter things, right? The, the grit. Well, you'll see a grit pump. Well, I mean, with the yeah, grit we'll pump. Yeah, we'll go out here. Okay. okay. And all of this is done remotely, you say, out of Coney Island? Coney Island starts to sequence with one click of the mouse and then the, the computer takes over and runs the equipment in sequence. And how is that transmitted? What are you using? Dedicated lines? Or how yeah, there, there's uh, T1 or, or uh, yeah, fiber optic, fiber optic, fiber optic between, between here yeah. and there. It, it, okay, now on the Guwanis, will that also be uh, remotely controlled? Yes. Okay. Also from Coney Island? No, no, from Red Hook. From Red Different Hook. drainage area. The, Coney Island has control because they just can't pump back at any time. They need to be within their process to take on more water. So you know, this is a one shift a day operation from my aspect. So if they want to pump back in the middle of the night, they can do it. So you'll have some guy in Red Hook monitoring whatever the equipment and handling this stuff remotely over it. That's right. Box. So when he's when the guy when the watch engineer at Red Hook says, "I'm ready to now pump back," 
He can just do it from his computer. And what else is Red Hook monitoring besides the Gornis? There are no other outside facilities operated by the, the um, watch engineer at Red Hook at the moment. I was going to say the, uh, which, which we're getting rid of, the, the yeah. Employees are anticipated for the Gowanus Headhouse. Um, I mean, around. I can speak to this project. Yeah. This was designed for 23 people. Okay. To operate and maintain it. I don't know what the number is for Gowanus. Yeah, I, I'd have to look it up. Yeah, but it's somewhere probably I don't know, eight to ten. I mean, I'm just, yeah, eight to ten. Some, okay. Yeah, and then that'll be that. The people that are working there, they're largely going to be in the building. There's not going to always be in and out picking up stuff because that only happens during a rain event, right? So there's always maintenance to be done. But there's All always this equipment ma needs to be maintained. A, that's exactly what I was thinking. So yes. that there, it is going to be an active site. Absolutely. In that way. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, just to follow up on that, so you'll have eight to ten people over in the Gowanus. Where will those people come from? They will come from my staff. So they, they, they'll be added to my staff and then be assigned to work in that facility on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, I don't know, I don't know if we discussed it earlier, but you know, I'm in charge of all of Staten Island, all of Brooklyn, and the southern half of Queens as far as pump stations, uh, inflatable dams, and those sort of ancillary facilities. You know, so on a day-to-day -day basis, I have crews in the field taking care of these facilities. The Gowanus would be one of them. Local training or local uh, employment? No. You have to be employed by the department first, right. yes. And uh, all the people who work in the facilities take civil service exams. Right. Before they come in, we do have, we're just starting to be able to have civil service exams for the people who haven't taken exams. Our green infrastructure program. Uh, but but for these, they're all, they're all exams. Yeah, I know. No, it's, it's a, you know, it's a, So the pump to my left here, the larger pump is what we use to pump the majority of the water back. Okay, it has a capacity of about 16 million gallons. We run two at a time to get the water out of here as fast as possible. But even at that, a full tank could take a day and a half to empty. The smaller pump next to it is what we pump the bottom portion of the water that has all the grit, the material that settles out. It, it's of a different design than the larger one. Okay, it, it's, it's a two-stage pump back. The water goes back and then the slurry goes back afterwards. You guys didn't just clean up this building as much as you were coming. This is the way it is all the time. This building has to be in a constant state of readiness because it's unmanned. No, it just looks clean. And is this where you come The pumps are way down below. So if we had to do maintenance on the pumps, we'd use this crane, lower it all the way down to the basement, we'd grab the pump, pull it out, do whatever we need to do. But these access doors lead to the tops of the five different pumps. So this is where the, uh, the out, where it, lead, where it leads, right? This is the end of the line for the... Where it gets pumped back to the... Correct. Yeah, so e the main pumps and the grid pumps have its own separate force main. They go straight out to the interceptor, where then it runs by gravity to the Coney Island plant. Okay. And this needs to be inside a building, right? Well, you, you, need, it, you, need, to you need an overhead crane, crane absolutely. Yes. Yes, you do. So is the screening room, is the, is the, uh, the filter, or, and is this yeah. or, or control of the boiler? It has to be in the So those yes. are the components that you have to have. You have to have, that's right. <coughs> All right. 
what that is is a breakwater tank. So what we do is, so the process areas can't cross-contaminate fresh water. Oh, right. This entire building is protected by that tank. Okay. So if, if I have a hose leaking or have some sort of vacuum in the water, uh, water system, it won't suck up sewage or, or some sort of dirty water back into the system. We use this break tank to prevent that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, is there any questions? Or, or uh, otherwise, we'll head back to the crew quarters. So uh, we'll actually we're, we'll head on out and uh, go right back to the van. Thanks very much. You're welcome. I'm going to hold it, I'll hold it for you. Oh, no, it's fine. Okay. Well, you know, my question about the plan is, 